attention, please. Hey, Joe. Everybody having a good time so far? Welcome to the Matheson History Museum. Quiet in the house. Hey, back there. I'm Robert Mounts, temporary board president. Last year, been a wonderful rain with the Matheson History Museum, capped by this wonderful exhibit you see around you, which was funded by Jeffrey Melton, Melton Law. And with the help of all these folks, the best exhibit I think we've ever had. It will be up for a couple more months. And following that will be a democracy exhibit. It is an election year. And we'll have a Smithsonian here, believe it or not, for an exhibit in the middle of the room. And uh, on behalf of the museum, I just want to thank Jeffrey Meldon particularly and all of these folks for creating this space, which we've used for now for more than a year to present program after program after program. They even got me to dance recently at our 30th anniversary, Sakop. This is the old American Legion Hall, and that's the dance floor. And tonight, we're gonna to reprise the panel discussion that we had a little over a year ago. Some of you may have seen, but it's a fascinating story. I was long gone by the 70s, but in the 70s, all of this took place and all of these folks came to Gainesville and it wouldn't have happened without people, without people like Jeffrey and John Moran in particular. Is John Moran in the house? There he is. Without these photographs, it would not have happened. And I also want to just a shameless plug. We're just finished the Amazing Give. You've heard about the Amazing Give for all the charities in Gainesville. We have a very modest goal in there to try to get five or six thousand dollars. We're not quite there. Maybe six hundred dollars more will put us over the top. Please support us through the amazing give. And thank you for being here tonight. And I'll introduce you to our our donor, major donor, and corporate sponsor, Jeffrey Melton. Are we having a good time? Yeah. Okay. How many here were here at a year ago when we had this uh, panel before? Okay. The reason I want to know is because we're going to be telling some stories. Some of them uh, were told before. Some of them haven't been told. So we might repeat ourselves. We might repeat ourselves. So anyhow, um, I want to introduce my panel first. This is um, on the end, the man responsible for this whole thing, uh, John Moran, a famous photographer. I, I have to tell you that, so John will tell you the story, but he was our house photographer, right? And I've known John over the years, and I was going to one of the, I think it was the Spring Arts Festival, and I saw John's work there. This is maybe six years ago. And uh, we started talking uh, about the Great Southern Music Hall, and he said, you know, I have every negative that I ever took, and I've got it in a box, and I've got a lot of negatives. I said, well, John, if you want to go and find the negatives and do prints, I'll, I'll be glad to buy them. Well, this went on one year, two years, the same dialogue. I'd go over and, and over again, over and over again. I said, John, I said, you got to go dig out the um, the negatives. And finally, OK, about two years ago, maybe John. You know, he goes in and he, he, it was like he had found gold or something, which he did. And I did. No doubt about that, Jeffrey. Um, yeah, it was quite a process. You were very patient with me over many years and um, it finally paid dividends. You know, to here's the thing about pictures, um, the snapshots. I've become quite the iPhone photographer, as have perhaps we all on some level. Um, and these moments take on added weight and value with the passage of time. 
even simple pictures, but especially when the photographs are of the music that defined our formative years. Absolutely. So, so John, John, I said, John, let's get all the, what was it, 21? Uh, you found 18 or 19, and then you found a couple more? Yeah, they're close to approaching two dozen. So I was only here for a year and a half as, as the house photographer, and then I you went on to got a girlfriend and had other interests. You no, know, John worked uh, at the Gainesville Sun and the Galligator. The Galligator, yeah. The Galligator. So anyhow, um, I want to tell you that John has become one of the most famous uh, photographers in the state of Florida. So, and, and when outside there's a library with books for sale, and one of his great books, Journal of Light, which I think is the last book you published. Uh, the next one is due, overdue, some would say, but I'm just noting, Jeffrey, as you're holding out that book, how well the color scheme matches with the exhibit here. I have never seen it. Rick Kilby, the designer, would be would be pleased. Yeah, oh, Rick did this. So anyhow, yeah, um, the the exhibit came together because first John, John and I said we'll go in the back room and we'll hang up twenty four pictures and we'll tell people to come and see the pictures. That's how that that was the idea, you know. And then and then uh, John said, well. I have this uh, good friend in Orlando who works for, you know, Universal or Disney or somebody and is really good. And why don't we bring him on as a graphic designer? And that would be the great Rick Kilby. Yes. Rick Kilby. Gainesville, uh, Gainesville native, living in Orlando now, and he's just a world-class designer. As much as anything else, Jeffrey, I think this exhibit is a testimonial to the power of good design matters i mean this isn't just a collection of framed pictures on a wall it's just it's you walk into the space it feels transformative uh, yeah so. and, and then Thank uh, you. then john says to me well we're going to need to have some dialogue and writing you know to explain what this was and of course john comes up with another a plus uh, team member who better to choose than the illustrious bill de young who for many years was the editor of the gainesville sun scene magazine and is a world-class music journalist and uh if you don't have a chance tonight which is hard in a party setting to read all the text up here and by the way this exhibit violates the cardinal rule of exhibit design don't make it text heavy people just want to look at pictures but de young has a lot to say and it's worth coming back on a, a weekday or the weekend and we'll, yeah, the exhibit hours until June 8th is the last day, is Wednesday through Saturday, 11 to 4. And it bears uh, repeating, it's worth coming back just to read the exhibit sometime. And on each picture, you'll see a QR code. And uh, Rick and I guess Bill, I don't know who decided to put the QR code. That was Kilby. Yeah, each QR code will link to a, a live music performance by the band depicted in the photograph. So bring your earbuds with you. It's, yeah. yeah. So, so anyhow, John and I conspired to get these pictures done. And when John finally got them done, uh, we framed them and they were beautiful. And uh, uh, I want to show you, these are actual uh, prints that are for sale up front. And um, here's, okay, so here's Jimmy Buffett uh november 14th 1974 uh waylon jennings july 13th 1974 who remembers spirit anybody remember spirit okay yeah february 22 1975 uh muddy waters october 1974 uh, we got Taj Mahal here. Okay, we had Taj back a couple times. Al, there's a story about Taj in the uh, sock. That was very. Go ahead, tell the story. Okay, I used to work uh, kind of for the for the backstage, and I'd take care of the musicians. And Taj Mahal is getting ready to go on, and he, he's got a tube sock. It's not that.
Test one, two. Test one. <laughs> That's a true story. Hello. We back. Hello. Take off the bottom end. Hello. Okay. One, two. Okay. We're back. And so this so um this picture is very special because many rippertons lived about five blocks from here and um actually many ripperton had a lot to do with the founding of the great southern music hall many ripperton's husband dick rudolph remember my you've heard of maya rudolph well so Minnie's husband, Dick Rudolph, okay, lived next to my Aunt Pearl in Pittsburgh. And we used to go visit there when I was a little kid growing up. And when Dick and Minnie moved to Gainesville, um, we became fast friends. In fact, when Maya Rudolph was born at Alachua General Hospital, uh, we were there when she came back from the hospital. And, uh, you know, we were good friends. I was there when uh i think it was epic records uh and yeah. pardon don dempsey well anyhow we went out to pirates cove out on the uh, lake bivens arm you know and uh, fed the alligators and all. but anyhow when maya was um born uh the song loving you was written and it was about maya rudolph and at the end of the song, of course, you hear Maya, 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 Maya. That's what the song is all about. So Minnie and Dick and myself decided we wanted to do a performing arts theater. And we went around Gainesville looking for a location. And um, the only location we saw uh that was even close was the cotton club which has now been restored as a uh, historical museum and uh we kept looking and looking well uh they got a contract to go out to la uh she hit big with loving you and i went back to practicing law i'd been i had opened my law office in 1971 and i um my dad owned a, a very large ni a jazz nightclub in Cleveland, Ohio. So growing up, I was around music. As a matter of fact, three of the artists that we booked here had played for my dad. Okay. B.B. Um, King, Dave Brubeck, and Count Basie. And it was really neat because when Dave Brubeck came to town, he came with his sons. We went over to the Primrose Inn for dinner before the show, and we had a lovely dinner. And um, I said to Dave, I said, this is pretty cool. Two generations of Meldon's booking, two generations of Brubeck. So that's my Brubeck story. So anyhow, what, what I want to tell you is that all of these are for sale and you can get any size you want just ask john moran and these are incredible pieces uh for any of you that were there uh they're absolutely uh fabulous and uh i can't say more about the work that john moran has done and the contribution he did to put this exhibit together Jeffrey, could I could I share? So, one? so this. Go ahead, John. Just an aside. I'm just imagining. Um, what are the odds if we'd gotten together 50 years ago, and decided why don't we get together and have a party? It was 50 years ago tonight that the Great Southern opened with the performance of the Earl Scruggs Review. And if we were the people in the audience that night 50 years ago, we got together and said, you know why don't we get together and celebrate the golden anniversary what do you suppose are the odds that every single one of us would be able to make it how did that happen are we the lucky ones look at that we're still here so a toast to us longevity so so anyhow 
Dick and Minnie go to LA and they, you know, do, you know, uh, have a fabulous, uh, you know, song with loving you and, uh, you know, uh, it was sad that Minnie went so early, but she was an amazing talent. So I go, I'm, I'm practicing law. I've got a, a, a partner, Peter Laird, who, uh, over his, he went out to LA and is representing, uh, Bette Midler. He's Dolly Parton, uh, Bon Jovi, uh, Rolling Stones. He, rep, you know, he, he had an incredible career Billy out Joe. there. Anyhow, um, I get a call from the gentleman seated next to me about a year after Dick and Minnie left town. So why don't you take over, Jim? Well, oh, this is Jim Forsman, my co-founder of the music hall. This is a very interesting story, but the actual person that got me involved with that building was Joe Silverman. And he was the one well, we were having problems there. I owned the property across the street and the theater had been run down. There were fights. Uh, it was nasty and cups and all kinds of nasty stuff going on. In fact, Dennis Leahy was, uh, played football with us in high school and he was a projectionist and he had a baseball bat up there because of the film broke, they'd storm the projection booth. That's how bad it was, but he was a tough guy. So one day Joe came over and had a flashlight said, Jim, I want to show you this. He said the Chautauqua circuit used to put on plays and there's a stage and dressing rooms and all these things. And we went over there and the theater manager let us in and we took the flashlight. We walked all around and Joe was showing it to him. He knew the theater pretty well. And from that point on, I just had to think about it. And Joe's a pretty good, he was a good salesman. So he had me pumped up that I needed to do something with this. I don't know if he wanted to do something, but he wanted somebody to do something with it. So it went on for a while and I was sitting somewhere with Larry Turner and I talked to him about it. And he said, well, you know, Jeff Meldon is trying to do something in Gainesville. So needless to say, he gave me his number. I called him and um, things started. And basically Jeff brought to the table the the fact that he had the contacts to bring in the shows and i was more involved with the operations of the business trying to make sure when people came there we could have drinks to serve them and have a play some kind of cash controls although those were a little out of control uh <laughs> i remember we sold rolling stones tickets and we were went to jacksonville and bought twenty five thousand dollars at a time and brought them back and we were selling them in the box office. There was so much cash. We were just throwing in a cardboard box, but we were charging, I think a dollar a ticket. Oh, wow. Yeah. We weren't allowed to do that because Peter Rudge, the Rolling Stones manager called me and he would not sell us any more tickets. But when we had those tickets, people were lined up around the block. It was a lot of fun. So we made, we made a couple thousand dollars off of it, I guess. Sidney Drashen was the promoter over there and he yeah. pre-sold a bunch of tickets and didn't cut the deal with the band until the day of the show. <laughs> he had, he had pre-sold all those tickets and he was still negotiating with them right up till the day of the show. But we, we were allowed to sell, what did we sell? A thousand or 5,000? 20. Oh, how 100. many did we sell? Yeah. I don't know. But the, the, the law in Florida back then was a dollar per ticket. Now, now, everybody Bobby that's D. what and Bobby this upsets D. me just because i would have never that was the farthest we ever got in selling tickets with surcharges now it's ridiculous what you have to pay to go to the citizens and i feel for everybody okay well it, 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 that was one of the stories of things that went on there but as it progressed we had to build the backstage backstage bar and we built the wine cellar and that goes back to the original construction because when I walked in there on March 1st, 1974, the owner or the manager of ABC theaters came in and we signed a contract and I wrote him a check for $5,000. So we bought everything in there, seats. Oh, the popcorn machine. That was real important. And, uh, that was one of my favorites and, uh, and we were ready to go. And from that point, didn't really know what we were going to do, but we were going to have concerts. 
And so a friend of mine, Dean Lowry, uh, came down to help me. And there was other volunteers, lots of volunteers to help us. Trip, Trip Jones. Yeah, these, these guys were great. And Dean was down in the, where it became the wine cellar. And that's where they had all the candy and stuff stored. And I heard that gun go off. I mean, it was bam. And I said, Dean, what the hell's going on? He said, I got that rat. <laughs> <laughs> so so we cleaned that out we built something called the wine cellar and then the next thing you know everybody says oh we need a delicatessen so the great southern delicatessen was born and that became a, a fairly interesting sandwich shop and then next door we uh built the um backstage bar uh and to and to have the beer kegs there was an old building right behind it kind of sub submerged where the oil tanks were for the old heater system. And so we took all that out. And at that time, uh, shredded newspaper was the insulation, I guess, every, you're supposed to use. So they came in with this shredded newspaper, insulated it, and we put a cooler on it. And that's where the beer kegs went and went, and the tubes, the cooling went through it, bringing the beer up to the, up to the bar. So uh, w what's interesting is if you if you all look, there's a sign here, uh, the backstage bar, and uh, I I get a call two months ago, literally two months ago, from the um, tax assessor for all of Marion County, George Albright, and George says, I I, I Jeffrey, I have something for you. I said well what he said 45 years ago whenever you closed the backstage bar a friend of mine stole that sock okay <laughs> i said no shit you know <laughs> he said yeah and he said and then he kept it for eight or nine years and had to move somewhere and somehow it became mine okay so george George took care of that sign for 30 some years. Okay. And two months ago calls me and says, uh, you know, uh, I have this sign. So I promised George that, uh, uh I would uh, bring it here today and, uh, tell that story. So that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Well, when we built the backstage bar, we had some old movie posters in there that may have been valuable, but at the time we laminated those into the tops of the tables. And, uh, then on the ceiling, it had been destroyed. It had a leak up there. So we tore out all that drop ceiling and just painted it black. And then we found some old lights in the back and put those up there and created this atmosphere. Uh, the bar was made out of, uh, some Cypress doors, which we sandblasted and put in sideways. And then the railing was a two by eight. We ran through the radial arm saw sideways, capped it off. And on the top was, uh, was that cedar plank and then just put the, the epoxy over it. So we, we were on the, uh, we, there's a lot of volunteers we had, we were out of money. So we just had to do the best we could with what we had. <laughs> so, so you just heard Jim say we signed the lease on March 1st, 1974, yes. right? How much was it per month? $1,250 a month. Okay. Yeah. That's now multiply that by five. So, you know, maybe a six, 7,000, whatever in today's dollars, right? Good deal. So today is April 26th, which is exactly 50 years from the day we opened the uh, Great Southern Music Hall, and it was also a Friday. Now, between March 1st and April 26th, which do the math, right? Two months, less than two months. Tell them how you put together the great, because Jim, Jim was the, uh, the, the in charge of all the inside stuff, right? I was supposed to be the outside guy. We, so, Albert called up and I think, or Jeff and said, we've got the Earl Scruggs review. They were supposed to be at the Hilton, I think. And, uh, 
they didn't have room for him and they wanted to get rid of the show. So, Hey, we're going to do a concert. Well, great. We're trying to get the carpet down. Okay. But we're doing a show. So they were rolling the carpet out, still trying to get the place ready with people coming in the front door, but the show goes on and the Earl Scruggs review, he pulls up with his family and everything. And they go up there and that's the first time it was used. And we learned a lot from that experience. So yes. Go ahead. At the end, Chris, we're going to have time. Okay. A friend of mine is here tonight, and uh, he's got to leave to go back to St. Augustine. But, uh, Albert, you know this guy very well. One of the big shows you did back in 1979 was you called me up one night and said, uh, we're going to do this band at this great Southern called Molly Hatchet. And uh, you played them twice in one night and they sold out. And this guy sitting to my right here is Keith Johnson, who in my opinion Jug was Ed. the greatest road manager Jug Ed. I ever dealt with. We used to call him Jughead because, well, frankly, he used to look like Jughead. <laughs> Can I tell but I just I just wanted to recognize him because he's one of my best friends in the business and he was I I used to run SGP over at the university and he was the best road manager I ever dealt with in the business. And he's got to leave to go back to St. Augustine. That's why I asked to be recognized. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Chris. Uh I I, I want to say something uh one one of the people that got me into this business a long time ago was that guy up there that's you know on the board it looks like you know in the in the blue jacket you know albert stand up okay the, albert 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 hired me and i worked at the great southern music hall for about a year, year and a half while I was going to school at Santa Fe, okay? So I want to thank Albert Tabaji for not only, you know, recognizing me, the potential that I that I might have, and I, it, not only did I work for Molly Hatchett, I used to work for one of the Allman brothers before I worked with Molly Hatchett, and it's all that guy's fault right there. <laughs> That's what I really want to be known for as life goes on is some great people that I gave a start to and, and, and really went far in the industry. You know, Bobby Lieberman went, for, Henry Rosquette was Jimmy Buffett's tour accountant. Uh, plow, uh, plows, uh, plows. Not uh, wait, wait, yeah. let's inter so Albert T. Badgey um, grew up in Daytona. And my wife at the time was from Daytona, so we had met, okay? And Albert graduated from Florida Atlantic, goes down to Miami and works for one of the biggest promoters down there named Lise Campbell. And um, I was Tom Petty's first lawyer. So I'm representing, you know, Mud Crutch and Tom. And uh, I, I, they gave me a tape of one of their new songs that they had written and uh it had some other songs on it so i drive down to miami meet with albert at least campbell's office and uh i say this band's gonna go somewhere and they look at me and say you're full of shit. this band ain't going anywhere. Now, i had never even booked a band at that time i was putting out tickets and learning the business i i, I shouldn't say i never booked a band I, I i had booked a band a couple of bands in college but i really wasn't nearly as involved at that point as I got later on in life. And a lot of it had to do with being here, you know, and because so of all anyhow, you. So the story goes that I go down there, uh, see what Albert's doing. And then uh, maybe a year later or whatever, um, I was doing all the, I was running an, a law office. I had a junior partner, three paralegals and my business is growing. So I decided to take on something else. I didn't have enough to do, right? So anyhow, um, 
I call, um, I, I did all the booking. If you look here up until the fall of 1974, those were the acts that I booked. And I was booking movies in and all this stuff. So when I realized that uh, I needed to get some help, I called Albert. He came up, took a look at the operation, and uh, he said, uh, I'm in. So uh, take it from there, Al. That's right. That's more like it. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. I did want to say one thing. Al, we were talking about um, Bobby Lieberman. Mm -hmm. yeah. You remember the night that uh, we had the devil, Miss Jones? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, he, I should have got him to come. I, I should have. Bobby Lieberman was uh, a great guy, and the, he would. We had a problem one night. Jim Coffins. Yeah, road Bob, manager. Road manager for yeah. 30 years. Well, he worked for the Gainesville Sun that, when he was with us. Right. And uh, But he, we had a problem one night with the, the movie we wanted to show, and um, there seemed to be some controversy over it. So we invited the state attorney's office uh, to review it because somebody said we shouldn't show it. And they eat at the Primrose Inn in the afternoon, so Gene Wentworth and the gang came over, and we showed them the movie. Well, there was really nothing in that movie that should have been risque, really, just kind of. So um, they said, oh, we don't have any problem with it. Okay, so we're we're getting ready to show the film. The, the theater was completely sold out. And those people, um, all of a sudden, I got a call from somebody who said, uh, there's somebody interested in that film. Look out across the street. And we looked out across the street, and there must have been 40 agents standing across the street and at that point we kind of said you know if there's a problem maybe we should have plan b so it went into plan b and everybody left and they asked albert who's in charge and albert said nobody <laughs> well i had booked a movie and you know i didn't know what how how hard they were going to go on us and i'd contracted for it so you know that put me as a participant in it whatever they thought they were going to do but it all worked out you know so, we showed it in base. we ended up showing it in jeffrey base. so anyhow albert is a talent buyer he comes in as the talent buyer who's got way more uh experience than i have and why don't you uh uh start off well i'd come from daytona and like he said um you know i was really close and extended family with the wagner family and uh, toby his wife was was one of the girls in the family so i i had grown up in daytona and in doing that i had become friends with greg and Dwayne allman and and good friends with them and you know and they were always into music and you know they were teenagers 13 14 15 16 and finally uh, you know i saw how driven Dwayne was i said you know Dwayne, i can't play anything and he goes well you know maybe you should get in the business and we had another friend of ours who was living there at the time that had gotten involved in the business toby roberts and that's how that's kind of how i got involved i wanted to do what i was doing so out of college at, in college at fau i got involved with entertainment and went to miami and worked for lise campbell who he's talking about and and in doing all that um i i you know i gained experience and what what happened was is and it's for you you're all you people here okay are responsible you're, you're all artists okay and i'm telling you you're artists okay and you're gonna laugh and say why are you saying that because you are because you're you're, you're creative thinkers you wouldn't be here if you weren't you wanted to come to see music you know so many of you and and gainesville had a special place as a really great market uh with vibrant audiences it was so much fun to do shows here you know i, I the bb king shows i always remember were special because he would come a couple times a year and all these women would call for him oh my god he had i mean he was just a great lover and he had 11 kids okay and 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 they would all go they they would all he one of them lived here they they would all go visit him in vegas i said bb how do you keep up with them he said once a year for three weeks they come to las vegas and stay with me 
This is a true story. And but when he come here, Preston Myers would always go come up to the come in and be in the dressing room and these women would show up and he'd take and then he'd take BB out afterwards, okay? You know, that was something that 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 really was special, you know. Uh, what? No, 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 I don't think she ever came. I know, but I know you. Yeah, press it ads. You guys, you know, so what, what do you want to say? So we had a deli at the Great Southern, and Wait, they would. Hold on. Let me introduce you, Barry. Go. On the, on the right side here is uh, our good friend, Barry Sides, who grew up in Chicago. Okay. And. Uh, <laughs> You know, Barry, Barry featured himself as a blues man. You know, he was this, how old were you, 19, 20, 21? I was a 22-year-old, long-haired, leaping gnome that came here to go to school, and I stumbled into this, and it really changed my life. The second day that I moved here, I got a job at the Great Southern, and I lived across the street, and the guy was putting spirit on the marquee. I went over there and said, hey, I just moved to town. I'm looking for a part-time job. He says, can you put this on the other side of the marquee? He said, if you write it down for me, I could probably do it. So I made him laugh, and that was my first show. But the press and ed thing, we had a deli, so we would, we would uh, cater the, the stuff, and nobody's eating anything. Couldn't figure out, why aren't they eating the food? And then there's a knock on the stage door, and it's press and ed with the ribs and the barbecue, and that's what they were waiting for. And, and uh... Barry had the uh, uh, great privilege of being the uh, concierge at times for the artists. So he'd pick them up at the airport, pick them up at their hotel, drive them around, and uh, you know we got to uh, you know spend time with them. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna get get into that. You have one or give us one story, Barry. Okay. So Greg Allman. Okay. The the uh, Great Southern did not have uh, bathrooms in the dressing room, so we would rent a Winnebago, and the artist would stay in the in the Winnebago. So Greg Almond's playing there, and I go like Kermit, five minutes, Kermit. And he's like, I can't open the door. I'm like, what do you mean you can't open the door? And he was so messed up that he could not, from the inside, open the door. So I had to climb through the window of the Winnebago and open the door. And he put his arms around me, and I walked him to the stage. He was so messed up, but I swear, once he sat on that organ bench, boom! I could not believe it. Just and that's, boom, that's, boom. That's that's the way he was. Okay, he he had extreme Gregory, and I've known Gregory since he was twelve. He had extreme stage fright, and he did drink a lot to be able to have the courage to go on stage. But once he sat down behind that B three, it was like his world started. Okay. And and he and he was like that for all, you know, a lot of his years. And eventually, he he, he didn't have to do that. But um, but you know, that, that's just something that 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 for him, he was required. And I dealt with some really harsher or tougher situations with him in bigger shows with situations like that. But it's just it was part of what when you decide to do this and you're dealing with artists, okay, you have to be able to relate to artists okay and people used to say well what is it you do well what i did was when i got here i was responsible for making contact with all the major distributors of the national touring talent and we had the great southern so we offered a place for them to play that relationship bond, bond, uh, bonded with gainesville and allowed you guys to all of a sudden get talent that you would have never got okay and you were able to go see shows and entertainment uh, for years and years. I mean, I think some of our years we had a, a average of a show a week. We had 54 shows a year, one year, and, and it was really great. And, and it was the relationships. Okay. Those relationships with the artists, with the agencies, with the venue, with the owners, with the city. Okay. That made it nice for all of you. Okay. All of you that came and supported us. And I, I, I really still appreciate it. Okay. So um, we had to let everybody know uh, what shows were coming on, right? And uh, we, I don't think we had money to do a lot of promotion, but we had um, 
a lot of people that would run around and put uh, little billboards or whatever you call those pla flyers, flyers uh, you know, on the, you know, the electric poles and all that. So I, uh, we had to find someone to help us with it. And it was uh, our good friend, Harry Michael. So Harry, come up for a minute here. I want you to, uh... so if you look around here, if you look around here, you can see these posts. And uh, Harry, so Harry has a bunch of these, the original posters. And uh, he was our first graphic designer at the Great Southern Music Hall. I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it graphic design. Not, not by a long shot. In 70, all right, which is 74, 75. So we didn't have a photo slop. We didn't have the internet. Yeah. We just get a phone call on Monday, Albert or somebody would call and say, hey, we got this band, like, uh, you know, some name we never heard of. Yeah, it was just, there they are, there's some of them. And they say, look, uh, we got to have a poster done by, uh, Friday, you know, and I don't know who it was is out putting them up. So in those days, you, you know, the show was on the weekend and you had to have something to handle. <laughs> and Al, I mean, uh, Oscar, the printer, Oscar Candelaria would be in the front room. Lovely. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, right here. Oscar, come over here. Our first printer. Yeah, he was our, our yeah. first printer. And Jeez. if you see stuff like like the Cheech and Chong over here, and then the um, the uh, Steve Mark poster to the to the left of it on the upper, yeah. Well, the prices for the show was was something, but we had gold paper and there was a gold foil, and Oscar came up with the idea of putting black ink on gold foil. It's a very hard thing to do. You had to put baby powder on it so they wouldn't stick. You know, mm -hmm. people don't think about stuff like that. So. I had to come up with a Dolly-esque kind of a, a background idea thing, with a, a comedy and tragedy for Steve Martin. Now, he used to do the Brown Derby all the time. We always saw him every Friday night, $3, and, you know, what's a guy with a rubber arrow and a banjo ever going to do in the world, you know? <laughs> He's, all right. It, it, just, it just never made any sense that he was going to, yeah, that he was going to be, um, like a, a actor or whatever else and you know we we did this stuff and the paper that we printed on was very difficult and it was of course oscar's uh doing and i sketch out something we had sharpies and ballpoint pens okay that was it am i right yeah and those press, and press on type press on type yeah and we'd have like a few hours we'd have to go off for lunch and have a few beers and okay and come back and yeah. get creative and then boom it, we had to do it that that night it dry cut them get them off to uh whoever was distributing and we had to do that for i'm like, going to tell the steve martin story now yeah four years or something we had to do that for. thanks harry hey, harry i think we call that hot off the press <laughs> So real briefly, Steve played, Steve Martin came to Gainesville for his first time and they booked him out at the Beef and Bottle and he'd, poor guy, they'd make him do like six or seven shows and he'd be really wasted because he had to sit out there and play two shows a night for three or four nights in a row. So I went out there the second time he played out there and I said, you know, you're drawing all these people. You really need to think about coming to the Great Southern. And I knew his agent and I, you know, I knew I could make contact with him and he was growing and, you know, he needed to play a, a bigger facility and expand his audience and probably get people more that would, the kind of people like you guys who came to the Great Southern. So I finally convinced him. I went out there and, well, I had to go out there one night late and sat with him. And, you know, I, I always tell the story. It was like a, 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 a seeing him in the movie, The Jerk, you know, he was like, you know, drunk and, and it said, you really think I can sell it out? And I said, yeah, you, I, I said, yeah, I really do. Okay. And I, I knew, I mean, I knew what I was doing and I wouldn't have had him do that. And that's how we 
came up with those midnight shows that well, we'd have after the movies would run um, on the weekends. Okay, we'd have him come on at twelve, and it was we had no production. We had no production and and had to deal with you know guitars and amps and sound and everything with him. So it was great. We could put him on at twelve, twelve fifteen, and he'd play till for an hour and a, and a half. But Albert, you got to remember the night that he marched everybody out in right. the middle of the street. Right. You know, you know that, that was just something really unique. And that was something that you guys, <laughs> for here in Gainesville, I mean, I don't know that he ever did that anywhere else. It, it, it was like the Pied Piper. He just had everybody out in the middle of University yeah, Avenue. Yeah, you, people followed him like the Pied Piper. Very close to that. Gary, that story they didn't want, they they didn't want to let him go. And, and, and he had him out in the street at 145 and the cops came and there was all these people out on university traffic going by i thought somebody could get killed we were out there trying to keep people away from the crowd and he was standing on top of the fire hydrant with an arrow through his head and everybody <laughs> laughing <laughs> and he said let's all go to jerry's for breakfast right you know the funny thing about when he i'd book him he would call me in the in the on a Saturday because he or Friday, whatever day he'd play. And he would fly in from LA and he was only getting fifteen hundred dollars a night. I mean that's what it that's was back then. Back. That was yeah. And it was just him. And he'd fly in and I'd pick him up at the airport and bring him to the gig. Okay. Take bring him bring him here and he'd have his balloons and his <laughs> uh, you know his arrows and his I had to have a stool job, for him man. and everything. But he did you know it was great. It was really fun. You know, he, we really had to, some great experiences with him. So, um, Jim, um, I'd like you to tell a, a story or two about some of the craziness you dealt with at uh, the Great Southern. Well, we had uh, one evening, George Kirkpatrick uh, and his friends had built Kentucky Fried Chicken in Germany. And he brought his main chef down to see a concert. And uh, they were standing in the lobby, and all of a sudden, the bouncers came down the ramp, came through the doors, and threw this guy out who was getting a little rowdy. And he turned around and started pissing on the windows. And, I mean, it was a mess. So it was a little embarrassing. Uh, another time, we were, we were um, having uh, – I think Steve Martin was there. And Joan Baez, well, I didn't know that's who she was, but she this car drives up, this Excalibur fancy car, and the lady gets out. We were sold out. So she wanted to get in. I told her that we were sold out. And you could have seen the whole, all, everybody working for us went crazy. Don't you know that? No, who is, that's Joan Baez. Oh, well, come on in. <laughs> and, then, and then we did these boxing matches. And um, one day we ended up at the Primrose Inn, having lunch with Angelo Dundee, which was Muhammad Ali's trainer. I mean, you know, to think about that for a minute, we didn't really think too much about it, but you think back about it, that's pretty interesting. And we ended up getting the uh, feed for the boxing matches, and we were scared to death because of what we paid for it. We're going to have to sell these tickets for $25. Well, we sold all the tickets, and people were calling wanting more tickets so it was standing room only we had people offering us hundred dollar bills in front just to get in and so, 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 story so angelo dundee's son uh came up here to go to well, to college actually he, he became an optometrist and jim jimmy jimmy dundee big jim and and so he comes up to the office uh, and i think i don't enforcement you must have sent him up there so he said look albert um you know i i can get you the licensing for all the all of Muhammad's fights, because they managed to handle Muhammad Ali, and and, uh, and Muhammad called the Angelo and Jimmy big thief and little thief. I mean that, and and I, I I'm sure that whatever it was, you know. But Muhammad, who for me was one of the greatest figures in in entertainment and sports ever. But he, uh, they gave me, they got me the rights to it, and I actually ended up doing it in in other cities. But I, we always got it in Gainesville, and that's how it got connected. and And I told Jimmy, I says, "Look, whenever we do a show, I'll give you a spiff, okay?" So he got five hundred bucks, and he loved it. That's a very Italian thing to do, okay? I thought and, we bought him a TV. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> we paid for the TV and all the equipment that they had back then. It was so archaic and we never knew if it was going to work. I mean, we didn't have net, the internet and everything going on in those years. And they'd, they'd sell you all this crappy equipment. It was expensive to have it, but it was part of the licensing deal. And, you know, you made, we made money though. We, but, we made well, money. The, the, you realize that that move, that, that camera they sent, the picture was probably not as big as that sign back there. It was in black and white. And I mean, you had to have binoculars from somewhere in there to even see it. So this was pretty uh, primitive. It was all through Bell South. It was Which TV. Was it was a uh, phone, phone lines. Bell yeah. South. Bell South, right? But uh, so, so the event comes off and it's standing room only. Uh, by, <laughs> by that time, we had a liquor license. Uh, Jim uh, was uh, okay. Friends I, I with... was in the office one day, and this envelope I opened it is a four COP liquor license. Never been in the business before. Didn't know what it was, but it said four COP beverage license. So I called Jeff and I said, "I think we've got a beverage license," and um, and we all got excited. So uh, we. We went and had the carpenter build us a couple of little bars we could put in the lobby and went to ABC to buy some booze and got some ice. And man, we were ready to go. We didn't know that was illegal. Yeah. So, so the, the, an agent shows up and he was real nice. He says, you know, you have to buy that through a, a distributor. I said, well, who are they? <laughs> So the distributors started showing up and uh, we went legit, but there at first we were having fun, man. We couldn't believe it. We were able to sell alcohol. Yeah, actually uh, credit goes to Jack McGriff, uh, one of the patriarchs of the McGriff family. Yeah. And he was a great insurance agent and uh, his office is right across the street from mine. At, uh, and so uh, Jim and I talked with uh, Jack and, and Earl Scarborough was his partner. And so anyhow, they were hooked up politically with the Democratic Party, okay. which controlled Florida at the time. This is 1974. And uh, the 4COP license, even back then, was worth like uh, seventy-five or $100,000. Lottery. However, however, for every... 2500 population growth in a in a county they would issue one more for cop which was like gold and you didn't have to pay anything except the annual fee which is twelve hundred dollars so we talked to them and magically this four cop uh, liquor license shows up in jim's uh, door. So that was the kind of stuff that went on. I mean, that was pretty uh, incredible. So then we were able to do liquor and all that. So anyhow, Albert puts together the, was it the rumble in the, in the jungle? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, remember Albert? We had the, the girls dress up. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Ali fights. You know, they're all they had Don King as their promoter, and you know he was a real character. And you know he'd always come up with a name: the Rumble in the Jungle, Thrilla in Manila. Um, you know, uh, I forget, but he, but because he, you know he was they were fighting George Foreman and and uh, um, and and Joe uh, Joe Frazier. So Foreman and Frazier, and you know that was that was the whole deal. So, um, but uh, that's yeah, you remember that era, okay? That's when there was real boxing. So anyhow, we decided we were gonna uh, be like the Copa Cabana in New York City, right? Yeah. As so a, we, we went and got the girls got some costumes. They were wearing their bikinis, I guess, and they had these trays and they had cigars and cigarettes, and everybody was walking around, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, the best part of the Great Southern was everybody could smoke um, because back then it was legal to smoke in a theater. Yeah, and we, we had everybody from Gainesville Police Department as our um, security. So uh, about uh, 20 minutes into uh, the late show, all of a sudden the smoke would start rising from the front of the auditorium. Not just cigars. Just cigars, yeah. And uh, I don't think anybody ever got busted uh, for uh, no. It was it was hot. 
it was a uh, peaceful coexistence with everybody at the Great Southern Music Halls. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want everybody here to, you know, tell a story that's either sexy or about drugs. <laughs> I have a sexy story. Yeah. To get shows to come here, sometimes I would have to book three cities. I, I did with Spirit. And then there was a group that Patty LaBelle had called LaBelle. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. And, and she hired Sarah Dash and Nona Hendricks to be in this band with her. And they were really, they had that really hit song, Bully Boo Boo Say, Avec Toi, you know. Um, they, they, they really, they had a hit. So I started them up in Tallahassee. And, you know, I'm single and I go up there and I'm with Jim and our treasurer at the time. And we drove up there. Okay. And I wasn't really planning on staying. Well, I'm watching the show and she has a woman in the band, Nona Hendricks, who's on, has passed away now, but she was really sexy. She had uh, whips and uh, uh, leather. Uh, oh, oh my God. Yeah, they were. And I mean, she was unbelievably sexy and the show wasn't really doing all that well. So I was not jumping around or doing anything. I was kind of waiting. So I sat there and watched her and I started fantasizing. Okay. Uh, 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 you know, about this woman. And I said, oh, wow, God, I wish I could be with her. So then we get back and we go back to the hotel and I'm just standing there greeting, uh, you know, just to say hi to him and thank him for the show. I mean, you know, legitimate stuff. And then we were going to get in the car and pile back. Well, she comes walking in and she grabs me by the hand <laughs> and she took me up to her room. <laughs> and I was really like, I, I, I was really in my mind, thinking it was a dream, but I was like probably the happiest guy in Tallahassee that night. Okay. So there's one story that they bugged me about. I was 22 years old. I moved here from Chicago. On the second day I, I moved here, I got a job. But just like high school, I was a little, I was two years behind most of my friends. But the, one of the first shows I did was Jimmy Spheris, and he was very popular here. Right, exactly. Well, he got me drunk as shit on Tangeree, and um, I never had gin before, and was hitting on me. And I got so scared, I ran home. Well, it's true. I got scared. Like, I don't know what to do, you know? Because during the load in, the piano tuner was playing uh, Color My World, and I started singing, not even realizing I was doing it as time goes. And he goes, Well, you really sing really well. <laughs> Whatever. And anyway, but I got when so I came I here, I didn't know who Jimmy Spears even either. was, and they were selling out shows with him. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, this is how different Gainesville was. Okay, uh, you know, with different things that we brought in, and uh, he was the guy. I said, "Who's this guy?" Jeffrey had him booked Scared already. The shit out and of you know, later on, we I booked all those acts that came in and did well in the beginning. But yeah, you know, they they struggled for six months, and then I settled in in September of that year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, and, you know, because he had to get back to practice in law. His, his wife, our dearly beloved sister, Toby, she called me and she goes, you got to come up here. And I said, what, what, what? She goes, Jeffrey needs some help with this music hall. And I said, yeah, OK. And that's when I came up and met and he explained to me everything. And, you know, we jumped in and we, we ran for a while. We had a good run. Jim, you got the sex? <laughs> Anyway, I think that my what is really amazing is that we had, you know, what a couple thousand people a night going through there for these shows, yeah, and twice. the impact it had on the community and on a lot of people and on us. Our impact was financial, a lot of it, but uh, because we lost a ton of money, but we had a hell of a lot of fun, and uh, I think that the. Uh, we learned a lot and uh it was uh organic growth because we really didn't have a plan and had no idea i think when we started that the demand would be would outstrip our resources right so i, I was invited to give a talk at the college of business administration and when i was talking to them i was talking to them about planning you know it's a really good idea <laughs> yeah. i said if, if yeah. You know, but at 25 years old, remember, we were young. We didn't think we were, but we were. I was 29. Oh, 20. we were 25. I was 25. I turned 75 last month. 
the first time I met Jimmy, I called him Mr. Forrest. 75. And so, you know, what he's saying is really true because I remember George Swinford owned uh, Lillian's and he was with, we were with some people one night and he goes, Albert brings a lot of people downtown, <laughs> you know, with these shows he does. And we was, they, I was on, yeah, I was on the downtown redevelopment advisory yeah, board. We were yeah. trying to get yeah. something going for downtown. We do two shows each night, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, were, we were actually the pioneers. You can't get acts to do the, yeah. the, the, what we did. And 810 as little, as little as show. we paid. Let me tell you, you can you could never do that now. Okay. You know, never happened. One thing about being a pioneer, you get shot sometimes, you know, if you look at those pioneers that were coming across there. And so we, we took a lot of holes and we, uh, we overcame it because we just kept moving Amazing, forward. Really, really. Even though we made some big mistakes, we just kept moving forward and it was a lot of fun. And I think everybody really enjoyed it. And this is an amazing uh, thing to be involved in. And we didn't know at the time it would be this, but it's it's lived and it's still alive. And it seems like everybody had a great time and that's the most important thing. We enjoyed our youth. Gabriel's with you, the market. So, for those of you that may remember, uh, there was nothing downtown for no. the students. Nobody downtown. You know, there was Wilson's uh, department store and J.C. Penney's and Silverman's. There's Silverman's with Young America. Yeah, Eileen Silverman. I, Eileen Silverman is here. She you. You get, we paid tribute to your father earlier because he was the one that got the whole thing started, really. He wanted to clean up the neighborhood, and he convinced the young kid across the street who had the Young American shop, right? He was a great salesman. <laughs> and so uh, what happened was when we started the Great Southern Music Hall, we said, oh, well, you know, it's a theater and people will, uh, you know, come here. We had no idea that we were going to revitalize downtown Gainesville. And within six months, uh, George Swinford and his crew opened up Lillian's uh, Music Store, okay? Lillian's was the second uh business downtown after us Nichols Alley. then well that Please, was a little days. later but yeah richmond smith who was from atlanta and he was a big time you know promoter in his own mind he opened up Nichols alley i don't know if anybody remembers that so yeah across the street in it it was the old yeah um shaw and keeter ford dealership building okay for the when i moved here in 1970 sean keeter was still there and the firestone building was yes. next to that okay so and the yeah, and, wise. yeah wise's drugstore was there silverman's so but there was retail downtown however uh there was hardly anything uh, besides retail there 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 you know there wasn't any clubs or bars. There may have been one bar uh, around. So anyhow, John, John comes to uh, Gainesville, eight, 18 or 19 years old. Fall of 1973. So did you get seduced by Gainesville and what was going on at the Great Southern? Uh, pretty much. No, I, I knew from day one that Gainesville was my town. And um yeah, the town I came from was receding in the rearview mirror, looking smaller and less relevant in my life. And uh, I have great memories of old Fort Myers, but I was ready to move to the Berkeley of the South, you know, Gainesville. When I was a high school student in Fort Myers, Gainesville had such a reputation and it did, it did not disappoint. Yeah. So what were some of the memorable uh, events you had? Uh, sex and drugs at the Great Southern Music Hall. I remember distinctly <laughs> great memories of the Halloween ball. Yes, not just on yes. campus but here at the great southern and folks i got to tell you the, the the pictures that you will never see on the walls of the mathis museum that i photographed at some of those halloween balls and um and the drugs here's i i just i remember i think it was at the spirit show after hours around midnight no it would have been later than that around 2 a.m i suppose i just remember 
uh, somebody in the projection booth put on, I think it was Fantasia, and then they cranked up Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon really loud. And I'm sitting there with a couple of dozen people out in the wee hours, and there's just a cloud of hot smoke rising to the ceiling. And at the end of a, a good day's work, yes. So just so you know, Spirit was managed by Milton Berle's nephew. <laughs> That's and the kind of stuff that happens in showbiz. Uh, you, you know, you, you know, and, and I asked him, his name was, uh, you know, uh, something Burl. And I said, and I said, you know, he says, well, I'm, I'm Milton is my uncle. And I, I mean, I think it was true, but, you know, but we loved having these groups here like that. Okay. You know, and I look at, at them now and I go all that stuff in the mid seventies and early eighties that we were able to bring in here. It's not like that anymore. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's not, I you mean, know, I'm that, sorry, but it's not the way, the way we got Jimmy Buffett here uh, the first time was, uh, I, so I'm practicing law and I'm representing all the marijuana smugglers in, in Gainesville. Right. And so we, uh, they, they 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 don't they decided to donate um ten thousand dollars to the muscular dystrophy association anonymously right and uh wow. and, and they were all friends with yeah, jimmy yeah. buffett when he was really hanging around smugglers and in, in uh key west and uh other parts of florida so uh they they found out that i was you know doing the great southern music hall and they uh they came to me to see if they could put on uh the jimmy buffett because they were buddies with him and that's how we got jimmy buffett when he was just kind of breaking out something like that but anyhow okay i wanted to um find out if there's some folks in the audience that were yeah, right. there and or might be able to tell us uh, their own story as far as uh what happened come on Patty Glenn, come on, Patty. Patty said that she was almost at every show at the Great Southern Music Hall, and she was 17 years old, but we didn't know it. I think the law was 18. There was a brief time in Florida where the law was 18, but of course, every young girl and girl, Gazel has a fake ID. I mean, back then, but I, I can't tell you now how much impact the Great Southern Music Hall, Hall had on me music is colorblind and i i don't think we paid a lot of attention to it back then but you brought the best artists i mean i could pinch myself to realize that we experienced all that i would give anything to have a place like that again um if y'all want to do it again we just don't just do it again. but the the artist music is colorblind and that's the thing it was never about it was about the music it wasn't about what color skin anybody had. It wasn't about what they look like. It was the art of the music. And that stuck with me 50 years. So I want to thank you because it really, and now I sing. We didn't even know I could sing back then, but you inspired me. That's what I, I, I just have to tell you. You inspired me so much. And I remember those memories are greatly cherished. So I think it's historical. Thank you, Patty. Hand the mic to somebody else. Anybody else? Go hand on the mic. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, it, go ahead. I got one real quick. My name is David Hammer. I grew up here. My dad came to get his PhD in August of 1960. And the first musical event I ever went to in the Florida theater was the Beatles' Hard Day's Night, where you bought a ticket in advance and you couldn't hear a thing because the girls were screaming even for the movie. The answer, Jim, to the question about Buffett was because I was at that show. It was supposed to be Jimmy Buffett and the Coral Reefer Band, and Buffett comes out on stage by himself and he plays a couple of songs. And we're figuring, okay, you know, we've seen this before. People do that and bring out the band. And he says, Well, you know, I know y'all paid tickets or paid to buy tickets to see Jimmy Buffett and the Coral Reefer Band. He says, But last night the band just up and quit me. He says, So I'd like to introduce you to the Coral Reefer. And as I live and breathe, a guy in a one man band outfit walks out on stage with the bass drum and the whole nine yards, and they played the whole freaking show. It was fabulous. <laughs> My question, though, is, first, I want to say, this is great. John, your work is fabulous. I've been following it forever. Bill DeYoung's a friend of mine. Jeffrey, you know, all credit due to you. My question is to you, Robert Mounts. 
This is a historic museum, and I was told by Gary Gordon a bit ago that all of this is on wallpaper. And I hope that all of this timeline is in panels. So can we get you to confirm right now that you're saving this and this will become part of the permanent collection and be shown about every five or 10 years from now into perpetuity? It's not on me, thank God. I think it's on John Moran and some of your friends, but I hope you're working. I, I know we want to get a videographer in here to take the whole story all the way around and preserve yeah. it digitally. Yeah, How's that Jeffrey has coming? contracted with Eric Flagg. Many in the room know Eric, of course, who's going to create a walkthrough video of the exhibit. Okay. And, and we hope to partner also with Bill DeYoung and the telling of the story of the, historically of the Great Southern Musical. I don't know if there's going to be a print product like a book or a museum catalog, but we're working on putting together a series. It'll be tightly edited and well written, but uh, we're going to put out a, a video that will live, live on. In the meantime, you have to, until the end of June to actually come and okay. walk through, starting over there and read all the way around the room. The story is in full. It's a great story. And bring your smartphone. You know, click on the uh, QR code. You'll bring up a YouTube video of the music. And I'm going to say something Caitlin told me to say in the beginning that I forgot. This is partly sponsored by Visit Gainesville, Latchford County. And, and Bob, just to confirm a detail there, Saturday, June 8th is the final day of the exhibit. The exhibit will come down on Tuesday, June 11th. So we have five weeks now to see it. Hi, I'm Jeff Goldstein. I was uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Rose Community Center, which you probably remember. We did a lot of shows on the University of Florida campus. Mm -hmm. And we were actually in competition at the time doing shows and stuff, which is pretty funny because we're friends. But you mentioned Joan Baez, and I wanted you to know how she ended up at the hall that night. Because the next night I produced Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder Review with Joan Baez and Kinky Friedman and Roger McGuinn and a whole bunch of people at, in, in Florida Field. So the night before the show, Joan comes up to me and she goes, you know, I heard about this show in this place called The Great Southern or something like that. She says, I'd like to go, how do I get there? And it was me that gave her directions on how to get down there that night and show up at the show. So I just wanted to say that. And she was on Bob Newer's motorcycle. Yeah, she was yeah, riding yeah. on the back of Bob. Oh yeah, Newer. yeah. And it was it was Steve Martin. We got Steve Martin to actually MC that show yes. in Florida Field, the Bob Dylan show. Yes. It was great. It was the next day. Yeah. So that's how Joan ended up there that night. I just wanted to say that. So anyhow, um, could I? Is could there I, anybody else yeah. in the audience that wanted to uh, participate? Go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Um. I'll be anonymous for tonight. Gary Gordon, the mayor of rock and roll. I, I just want to say a couple of words about something that's been mentioned, but not highlighted. Uh, and that is the backstage bar and the wine cellar. Yeah. Many of us who were local musicians at the time of the mid and late 70s had the opportunity to play and make money at the wine cellar and at the backstage bar. I had the opportunity to do both. Uh, there were many people, um, Barry, I think you might've been one of them also. Oh yeah. Um, and you know, when you look for local gigs that pay money, it's always a scramble. Um, so that was one of the benefits of the music hall that they had. We played, when we played the uh, backstage bar, we played Tuesday through Saturday. So it didn't matter if there was five anything going on on the main stage. Night. Five sets a night. Yeah, and if if there was a if you played at the uh, wine cellar, there was also five nights. So five sets. A so night. sometimes there was nothing else going on, but I loved working five five sets a night. I loved working five nights a week. That was the way our band really became a band and got tight. And of course, everybody knows. The rest is history. For twenty five dollars, <laughs> five sets a night. No, I got I got more than that. Sorry. Okay, uh, you did. At, at any rate, um, that I think that's another reason to celebrate the music hall. And then I just want to put in a last minute pitch.
for my favorite artist who worked on the main stage, and that was David Bromberg. Yeah. Absolutely great. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else? Um, our, our panel here, do uh, you have any other comments, John? I, I just, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, well, thank you. First time I've said so tonight, but I just want to thank Jeffrey for his patience, his perseverance, and for his deep pockets. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I reflect a lot on that time, and I'm just, the, the thing that has kept me going here in Gainesville, I think, is the energy manifest by what we feel in the room tonight. Gainesville is a community of ideas and people and creative, energized people like yourselves tonight who have helped to create community. And that has been a sustaining force in my life. And I'm so proud to call Gainesville home. And Gaines, Gainesville in the 1970s was Jeffrey. a magical place at a magical time. And thank you for coming out to help us relive that incredible era. Thank you so much. For yeah, I, so much. you know, mentioning uh, the legacy of uh, Gainesville as a music scene, uh, Hoch Shikama from Hartwood. Yes, absolutely. And I want to thank Hoch for Hertz. everything he's done to help create uh, it. Y'all, I mean, if any of you haven't been out there to see a show it's in amazing. the studio, it's friggin' amazing. You just got, I mean, the sound there is the best ever. So uh, let's support uh, Hartwood. Barry? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Hartwood is the greatest. The music hall became my muse when I moved here. I just couldn't believe the pile of mud that I fell into. I mean, I was 22 years old and, and I, I was like working with my record collection from high school. It was amazing. And I fell in love. I had a love affair with this building. I mean, to me, it breathed, and it was amazing. And Eileen, your your store was next door, and Wise's uh, drug store. Mm -hmm. It really meant a lot to me. It was amazing. And you know, I was cutting my chops, and I learned, and then eventually I got started playing and opened for Bob Dylan and stuff like that. But I could not have done any of that without the great Southern. I don't know if, they, if all of you heard of a thousand voices of Florida. They're going to be doing a concert Sunday at the at the uh, Cade Museum, and um, they really are incredible to watch. And Tran, the piano man, is going to be singing when the saints go marching in. That ought to be interesting. <laughs> Do I, I, yeah, what I would have to say is, you guys, it's you, 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 and and we're all artists, okay? I mean, and you might think I'm crazy to say that, but if you think about it, everybody's got that, okay? And and the reason you're here is because you thought creatively, you wanted to see music, okay? It attracted you, and Gainesville is a creative area, you know. Hoach, what he's doing. Uh, uh, that exemplifies it to me whether he's got name big name talent or not doesn't matter it, it's just that you gotta you, it's gotta be the market okay and and you guys were the market okay and you, you probably still are but uh you know we were able to accomplish some really great things and and i really appreciate it from my side of it and appreciate you and what I think is really cool is, you know, we were all in our 20s. Uh, John Moran might have been 19 or 18, right? <laughs> and we, Jim and I, you know, we go down to uh, which bank was it? Citizens Bank? Not no, Citizens. We went to University, University and Bob, Bob, Bob uh, Coons, Bob Coons. Bob Coons. Bank. So we go down to the bank. We're a couple, <laughs> you know, 20 year old kids, you know, and, uh, we go, well, we're opening up this great Southern Music Hall and we need some money to do the renovations and get it going. And so, well, how much would you like? $50,000, which back then was like 350 or 400. For anyhow, it was a lot of fucking money back then, right? <laughs> and, they, and, and two days later, he says, come down and get your check. Okay. Jim and I are still paying that off. Wait a minute. We went back and got another fifty, so we ended up with a hundred. 
Well, anyhow. But uh, really, really, it, whatever you think you're going to need, if you think you're going to need 50, then you probably need 150 to 200 because you it's it's always two or three times whatever you think you're going to need to do something. So anyhow, I want to thank everyone uh, for coming. Oh, wait, Eileen Silverman, no I'm one sorry. better to close the show than uh, the the Eileen, the, no, the daughter is... of the instigator. That, that makes me very proud. Thank you very much. I know my dad was a good man, but but really this is something I want to say. Well, you know how much I, I love all of you up here, but now that we have such a warm, warm, wonderful crowd here at the Matheson History Museum, I want to take this moment to say how much I hold in high regard Caitlin Hoff Mahoney, Executive Director of the Matheson History Museum. And I had the wonderful privilege to interview Caitlin during the amazing give on a live stream that was just Thursday. And she has um, moved forward with this museum with so many programs. This is proof of it. Programs and exhibitions and opportunities for this community and Bob Mounts and the board and all that they're doing and the grant, the matching grant uh, to make things possible to digitize the postcard collection here. That was part of the amazing give. But I just want to say, Caitlin, you're doing an amazing job. And the Matheson History Museum is just a wonderful part of this community. And we all feel that here. I just want to thank you. So it's Kate, Caitlin and, and Bob Mounts have been incredible. Uh, they've been great partners for the last uh, year and a half. Uh, and it's really been a privilege to help uh, put this uh, together with my uh, partners in crime here, and uh, I really, I'm really promoting uh, John's work because I love it. Okay, so look, if, if you want to have a beautiful piece of art in your home, go either buy one of the, the pictures here or see John directly. He'll make it. He'll frame it any size you want, and his work to this day, 50 years later, is still remarkable. So I want to thank my uh, partner, Don Moran. Okay. Well, that's it. I think we've got uh, some more music coming, and I want to thank everyone. Does, there, does everybody want to dance? To the Great Southern Music All right. Hall, 50th Well, we'll take these chairs. Thank everybody. We'll clear Bye. this little area over here, and the band can play some songs for you.